Greetings. I hope and trust. I find well, my dear friends, and we are on the fifth lesson, dealing with debt. Dealing with debt. Let us spend a moment together in prayer before we proceed. Let us pray. Kind and gracious Father in the heavens above, thank you, dear Lord, for being our provider. Thank you for being our sustainer and being the Lord who recovers us. Take us out of our Egypt of bondage. Some of us, we are sinking in debt. And as we go through this study, how we pray, dear Lord, that you may give us lessons and tips that will help us both as persons and even as a nation. In Jesus' name we pray and we ask, Amen. My dear friends, this uh, study uh, gives some points that I find very difficult to argue with. Some may say um, the author is not a financial analyst or financial advisor. The presenter is not a financial advisor. And I should start with this disclaimer. Basically, I'm an art student. I'm an art student. And today I want to discuss business issues from a bystander's perspective. What I've noticed is that business is built around two issues, managing credit and debt. When I did uh, a bit of accounting at university level, having not done accounting at all, I actually had a problem when you get to the trial balance, what goes on the debit side, what goes on the credit side. And uh, much credit goes to Dr. Florence Zimonia, who then gave me this interesting way of uh, appreciating debit and credit. You debit the receiver, you credit the giver. So if you are a company, what you're actually doing, basically, is you want to make sure that people who have paid you for services, you credit them. Those who have gotten your services and they have not paid you for those services, you debit them. So those who have amounts that are owing in the debit column, these are the ones we identify as accounts receivables. And those who have uh, amounts that have been given on the credit column, this is income that you have realized. So those who are in the accounts receivables, they're the ones who owe you. These are your debtors. And should you have a scenario where you are the one who's owing the other person, those whom you owe are your creditors. Now, having um, done our accounting 101, what I want us to look at is that this is something that we can say is purely an accounting issue. But when you are in your business transactions, you want to make sure that you have more credits than debits. So those who are doing bookkeeping and accounting, they are managing these two things, debits and credits. So when you have your debits being so high and you are not going to be able to recover them, what you do is you put in an allowance for bad debts. The prescription period, we're going to get to the limits and um, looking at some of those debts that you may not recover. But before we fast forward and go that far, now, in terms of our accounting, simple accounting, we've already said it's a debit and a credit. So when you now get to the banking side of it, from the financial point of view, so you're going to find um, um, accounts, um, I mean, banks that will say they are availing credit to you, credit to buy your car, credit to buy a house, and you're saying you're buying it on credit. Actually, uh, you're not buying it on credit as such. You're buying it on debit because you're going to end up owing the bank for the car or you're owing the bank for that house. And here's the unfortunate thing. And as much as debt may be something that is bad, some people have made a living out of debt. They are those who go into repo business. They repossess those who cannot pay off. So they repossess your house and they resell it. They repossess your car and they post it on Facebook. We congratulate so and so for having purchased a repossessed car. What they're actually doing is they're doing business based on your debt. Your debt. So then let's move to economics. When you get to economics, you know, we've looked at the loans from the banks. We've looked at the business from the trial balance internally. When you now get to business at a national level, we still have the same thing. This is where you're going to talk about a national debt or a sovereign debt or a public debt. What we're looking at is um, how much the country owes. 
And usually they'll be owing to the Bretton Woods institutions like the World Bank or the IMF. So at a national level, you could have a scenario where you are owing. Now, um, how do we get to owe at a national level? I'm still going to come back to at a personal level so that we, we, we bring it down. Once it lands, then we take off into the Bible. How do you get to owe at a national level? What happens is there is what is known as a BOT, balance of trade. Balance of trade simply means you are looking at what you are importing vis-a-vis -vis what you're exporting. So if you are importing more than you are exporting, you're going to have a negative balance of trade. If you are exporting more than you are importing, you're going to have a positive balance of trade. Now, how do you know when to import and when to export? We go to the other term. I'm sure you've heard this one, GDP. What GDP simply refers to is the gross domestic production. And gross domestic production is basically the working capital that the country has vis-a-vis -vis the value of the goods and services produced within that year. So where you have less goods and services produced, and therefore, less goods and services exported. What happens is that you're going to end up using your capital to purchase goods or services from outside. You import them. When you import more than you are producing internally, what happens? You're going to have a negative balance of trade. I have simplified it the best way an arts person can understand it. Now, let's come to an individual. You need to look at the same concept and say, a concept and say what is my balance of trade? Do I consume more than I produce? If you consume more than you produce, chances are you're going to find yourself living beyond your means. Now, Paul says, you need to pray for the spirit of contentedness so that you live within your means. When you do not live within your means, what does it mean? You are importing more than you are producing. When you import more than you produce, what do you do? You go to your working capital. You go to your finances. Because you are not producing more, you're going to get these funds in order to go and purchase those things which you're not producing. So what then is the solution? It's a simple thing at personal level and at national level. You have to produce things more than you are buying. You're going to need to do more services that you're rendering, which will give you more income for you to purchase those things which you're not producing. So when you are purchasing more than you are earning, you're most likely purchasing on debt. And when you purchase on debt, what then is debt? The author says it is spending what you are going to receive in the future today. I, I would want to add something there and say debt is simply spending what you have not earned. So when you spend what you have not earned, at any given point in time, that is a debt. And what is this debt? Some of us, we incur this debt based on money that we have borrowed. And there is the other debt that we also incur. This is the debt where you are spending monies that have been given to you. But unfortunately, these monies have conditions that are attached to them. You may not pay back. You may not pay back. But you'll have a scenario where you are now indebted to the person. You cannot be your own man. You cannot be your own woman. Why? Because this person paid your fees. Why? Because this person advanced you money. Why? Because this person maybe even purchased your car. So when people give us some of those things that have conditions that take away our power to decide, we have gone into a debt, even though we're not going to pay it back using monetary returns. So when we come to the word of God, it also has counsel for us on how we should recover from debt. How do we deal with debt at a personal level and at a national level? Let's start at a um, personal level. The book of Proverbs 22, the verses 7. In the New King James Version, it provides as follows, quote unquote, The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. So what is the difference between a rich person and a poor person? Well, it is your bank balance. It is your wealth. What is poverty? Having a lower bank balance. 
having a lower wealth measure. And here's the other thing. This person who is a borrower is not necessarily uh, poor. There are some rich people who are borrowers, by the way. Whoever is a borrower is a servant to the lender. So when you find yourself owing another, you become a servant. So being a servant does not mean necessarily you are poor. Some rich people are servants of those that they have borrowed from. They appear to be rich on paper. They appear to be rich in the eyes of those who are assessing them because they have no access to their accounts or how they've funded their operations. But these people, they are servants to the lender. These are the pipers that play the tune and they continue to dance. And when the piper plays the tune, how does he do so? He decides when to call in the monies, when to impose an interest, when to revise, when the, 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 the installments are supposed to come in. So, so, so you're getting that part of particular scenario where you're not in charge of the operations. And the Bible is clear, whether at a personal level or at a national level, when you or other people, you are going to find that you are not going to be your own man. Even when you are talking about a sovereign debt, you know, I looked at this phrase and, 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 and it's, um, you know, an interesting one. When you have a debt, you're not really sovereign. Are you? How sovereign are you when you are owing people? You, you, you cannot do or say things anyhow. Because really, you know there are consequences. There are consequences. So when you are in debt, you're not a sovereign person. And let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 12. Listen to what God says in respect of our nations. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure. The heaven to give the rain unto thy land in his season, and to bless all the work of thine hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. So God now talks of those issues we addressed. The GDP, the work of your hand. What are you producing? God will bless that. When the work of your hand is blessed, what will happen? Your GDP will go up. When you now produce in excess and you have a surplus, what will you do? You will export. When you export, your balance of trade is going to be positive. And when you have a positive balance of trade, guess what? You now begin to borrow and lend. I mean, you begin to lend those other nations that are going to borrow from you. This was God's promise to Israel. And I believe this is not unique to Israel. It is also true of Zimbabwe. It is true of the country where you're watching me from. God can still bless us as nations. God can still bless us. We are not excluded from receiving these blessings at a national level. And so having addressed some of these issues, what is the other thing that we want to look at? Paul then talks to us and he says, you know what? In as much as it may be impossible for you not to um, have a debt, there may be scenarios or situations in life, we're going to look at this, where you find yourself in debt. But be that as it may, as far as you are concerned, in Romans 13 verses 7 and 8, Oh, no man, anything except the debt of love. Love people unconditionally. You owe them that much. It is your responsibility to love them. Love them unconditionally. And these are the three reasons, basically, that have uh, led to people being indebted. The author advances three reasons why people find themselves in debt. Number one, they do not know how to handle money. They are financially illiterate. When they win a lottery, they don't know what to do with it. When they need to grow their investment, they do not know what to do. When they need to go and make money, they have no clue on how to go about it. And besides ignorance, which is not an excuse, by the way, the second issue is there is the issue of greed and selfishness. And in this context, where you're looking at greed and selfishness, people just fail to live within their means. They buy things just because they want them, not because they need them. They go into deals because... They want to get rich quick. They are not willing to wait for God to bless the work of their hands. We are a nation 
We are a tribe. We are a generation that wishes things will fall into our hands, but will not pick them up. We will not rear them. We will not keep them. We will not grow them. We're just selfish. We are greedy. It's just a competition. We want to wear the labels that we have not earned, that we have not purchased, because other people must see us. We want to maintain this particular, you know, start. We want to maintain this particular style and, and affluence in life that we, we, we are not able to sustain. And thirdly, of course, there are some who have fallen on um, misfortune, such as bereavements, or you have had a prolonged illness. And, you know, some of these illnesses, they'll drain your reserves and, and, and you find yourself with, with, with basically nothing. Or you, you could have even an economic meltdown where your finances are wiped overnight. So these are some of the issues that we, we may find ourselves dealing with. But be that as it may, be that as it may, there are some things that would generally apply to most scenarios. Um, number one, where we're looking at financial illiteracy, you, you know, you, you, you need to get this concept clear. What you have, earned, you have not earned, don't spend. Number two, the little that you have earned, grow it. Don't spend it all. Have a culture of savings. Have a culture of savings. And um, besides saving, also invest. But in your investment, um, do not be a risk taker. You know, exercise caution and get financial advice on how best to do these investments. And when you get to the issue of debt, you find yourself not having been wise enough and you've made the wrong decisions and you're stuck. Or secondly, you have not been um, temperate enough and you are stuck. Or thirdly, you find that you have um, a, a situation that has left you cleaned out and it was unavoidable. Or to begin with, you, you are not in debt, but you are just reading at minus because of you know, life has not favored you that much. You, you want to go to university, Solus University. Um, we are, we're having our intake in March, by the way. Uh, if you're interested in uh, joining Solus University, come through. We are not the most expensive and neither are we the cheapest. Come through, the Lord will provide for you. We have programs that you're going to enjoy and uh, let's, let's interact one-on-one. -on -one. But as, as, as you're thinking of going to some of these uh, universities, so Lucy has a work program, university uh, program, that while you're there, you can work, uh, earn some money to offset your, your debt. N now, we have people who are not as financially privileged, but are not keen on working either. It, it might not work. So, so when we find ourselves in a scenario whereby we are not as financially liquid, we need to then start thinking about how do we claw out of this situation. So the author provides three basic principles. The first step is that imagine that debt is a, is a hole that you're inside. Um, rule number one, if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. There is no way you're getting out of it by digging. Start thinking about how to fill up the hole and get up to, 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 to ground uh, level. So when you are in debt, rule number one, stop accumulating more debt. So whatever is causing you to have debts, Stop it. Is this common sense? Definitely. <laughs> it's common sense. You don't need a degree. Stop what makes you accrue debt. There are some people who say, I'm a shopaholic. And what are they doing? They're swiping with a credit card. You're earning money. You're spending money that you have not earned. And as a result, you're sinking in debt. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Yes. All right, let's get to point number two. The other thing you want to do after having told yourself, I'm not going to do this anymore, I'm just getting rid of it. If you have a debit card, just clip it. The good thing about being in Zimbabwe is we don't even know what a debit card is. Can you believe it? We are a cash economy. If you don't have the money, you don't spend. Uh, well, there's a difference maybe with your mobile phones. You can uh, star 179. Is it 179, I think? Uh, star 179 and you get I mean, airtime on credit. But when you default and you're not paying that well, they block that function for you. 
and you don't really get much of it. But there is very little of credit that you can get in Zimbabwe. So it, 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 it's an economy that is um, a, a bit harsh. <laughs> if you don't have money, you really feel it. You don't have it. You don't have it. It's that simple. Have money, pay, and spend. And um, so when, when you get to the issues of trying to address that as you're stopping, cut those things. If it's, if it's a debit card, cut it. I mean, a credit card, cut it. Now, if you were to itemize your debts, you, you, you want to make sure you work towards paying your debts off and you want to pay them off as quickly as possible. By the way, paying a debt is biblical. When we say um, pay off debts, there's a story in the book of Kings. A, a woman is found in a quagmire. You know, a man is about to come in and take his children away, her children away. And she goes to the man of God. This man, prophet, son of a prophet, loved the Lord but left a debt in the home. Now that he's gone, this man is coming in to take my children into captivity. How am I going to make my way around? A miracle is performed. She has the blessing of oil. Goes back to the man of God. And what does the man of God say? Go and pay your debt. There's some who have prayed and God has blessed, but we have forgotten to go back and pay the debt. So what the author then support, I mean, suggests is you want to start clearing these debts from bottom and working your way up. Clear the lowest of them. Go to the next one. Go to the next one. Go to the next one. At some point, you must come to a scenario where you are now able to sustain yourself. And when you get to zero, begin to produce and continue to produce. That way, you begin to turn your life around. And this is godly, by the way. It is godly. Maybe I'm, I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure you get the point. I'm sure you get the point. Here's the other thing that also happens. You, you, you may look at the other issues that he raises there. Here's the other issue that happens here. You, you, you know, you get a scenario where we want to get rich quick. I remember at some point there was, um, you know, a, a rise in this kind of companies right here in Zimbabwe where you're told, put in $100, come back after a week, you get $1,000. And what tends to be the case is that the first person usually gets their money back. When they have bought confidence in the masses, someone will plow in a whole thousand or $10,000 and you're told, come back after a week, you're getting this as fifty thousand. Come back after a week. You're getting this as ten thousand. You're getting this. You know, it's just some 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 crazy figures. And people go in there and they put in all their life savings. And the next thing you come back, there's no office. There's no one there. Your money is gone. And how does this how does this happen? Because we want to get rich quick. We don't want to work. That's not how you recover debt. That's not how you become rich. You become rich by working. That's the principle. That's why people who are not even believers are rich. <laughs> it is not because the devil is blessing them. No, 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 no. It's the rule of life. It's the rule of life. It's the principle of life. You work, you get returns. That's how it is. God blesses the work of your hands. The work of your hands. And here's the other thing also. Um, even... In the churches, communities of faith, we have a lot of strife. People are not on talking terms. And what has led to this? Someone borrowed money and they've not brought it back. Now we have end of the quarter, Lord's Supper. You can't even wash each other's feet. We can't even talk to each other. You know, the, 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 the worship environment is messed up. Why? Because people have financed their style at the expense of church members. And the Bible is clear as well on this. It, 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 it is not just silent. You will not be a guarantor. Do not be a guarantor. When you act as a guarantor, guess what is going to happen? When that money is not paid. When that money is not paid. Proverbs 6 verses 1 to 5. When that money is not paid, you are going to find yourselves fighting. You're going to fight. Whether it's a family, you're going to fight as individuals, you're going to fight as members of the same organization or church. And studies have shown most of the people who are not creditworthy, 
if the bank thinks they will not pay, what makes you think they will pay you? The bank couldn't trust this person that he will pay. What makes you trust the person that he will pay you? So some of us have operated on trust. And where are we? We've lost more. And what has happened to our relations? They have been what? They've been severed. They've been broken irreparably. irreparably. That's the unfortunate part about it. And here's the other thing that we also want to look at. You know, there's the, what is known as the prescription period or doubtful debts, making a provision for doubtful debts. You know, there's some people that we're going to allow to enjoy our services or products with the hope that they're going to pay. They may forget to pay. <laughs> they may fail to pay for whatever reason. We need from a financial position to make a provision for doubtful debts. And how do you make a provision for doubtful debts? Basically, you're simply saying, uh, of what is owed, what has been my collection experience? If I'm in a business, what has been my collection experience? And uh, secondly, do an aged analysis of these people that are owing me. How many of them have been owing me for a year? How many have been owing me for two years? How many have been owing me for three years? How many have been owing me for five years? Oh, seven years. So what you then do is that when you have money that has not been paid maybe in seven years, you just write that debt off. You say, this money, there's no prospects of me collecting it. So, and you also want to look at, is it possible that the cost of recovering the money, because it's nominal, if I'm to engage a debt collector, if I'm to engage a lawyer to go for recovery, it will cost me more. So you just write it off. It's common sense, isn't it? But it's better common sense not to find yourself in that position. So make sure those who enjoy your services, they pay you upfront. That's common sense. Common sense. Now, when you and I have to deal with the doubtful debts, you have a scenario whereby if you do not claim your debt, your personal debt, for a period of three years, at least in the Zimbabwean law, that debt prescribes. You cannot go back at law and seek to enforce and recover that money unless it has been acknowledged to have been owed. However, should someone decide to pay you even after the period is prescribed, there's no problem. That still becomes a money owed. So I'm not saying to you who are listening, um, if you are owing and it's been three years, don't go back and pay. Remember the imperative of 2 Kings chapter 4. Now that the Lord has blessed you, go and pay. Pay your debts. It's a biblical imperative. Recover from debt and you settle your debt because when you go out there and you owe people, you are an embarrassment to the Lord who is blessing you. You are an embarrassment to the Lord who is blessing you. And God also made it clear as you look at the book of Leviticus, the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy, what he then uh, made clear was that those who owe you, if you have a brother, a fellow Jew who owes you and it's been seven years, write off that debt. It's a doubtful debt. So, 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 so we've simply picked that and we've put it here in business. So when God is talking about being managers for the Lord, as we are managing for the master till he comes, we are going to find that there are people who may owe us. And really, the poor shall always be amongst you. So if you have such people, it is good practice. You just write off the debt. Write it off. You will not get that money. It will not be cost effective to try and get it back. So these are some of the terms and limits that we are finding here. But in conclusion, in conclusion, we have a whole country that has to do a liquidity ratio. What the liquidity ratio basically does, what are your current assets divided by your current liabilities? If all your debtors were to come through today and ask for what is owed to them, will you be able to pay them? If so, then your liquidity ratio is at 100%. But if you will not be able to pay them, then your liquidity ratio is less. It continues to be less depending on how many people you can pay. If you can pay none of them, then it goes to minus. So you need to have a liquidity ratio that is above 100%. Then we know you're someone who can settle their current liabilities. You can look at the current ratio or you can look at the quick ratio. Now, as you look at these ratios, God is saying, what my children need to do is to appreciate that whether as a nation, whether as individuals, I can bless the work of their hands. We do not look for holy water 
to get us out of debt. We do not wipe people's property so that it becomes our own. We do not pray for debt to go away. We work and we pay it back. And above all, you do not spend that which you have not earned. If you are the Lord's manager, if you are the Lord's manager, surely these are issues that you must understand. They are simple and straightforward. The Lord is embarrassed, is embarrassed by people who owe their neighbors and they do not see eye to eye. Witnessing has become a problem because you cannot go next door. You cannot go into your neighborhood. You owe everyone along the line and even at the back, at the other side, you still owe them. So you're making the whole enterprise unattractive. This is what we call the goodwill in business language. So God is simply saying, I need my children to have goodwill. Not be credit worthy, be goodwill. A good name is to be treasured above all things. Let people know if ever you have a debt, you pay on time, you pay even ahead of time. And above all, and above all, you represent God everywhere you go. In as much as you could have debt, manage it, claw your way out of it, stop digging the hole, start clearing those debts, and if you do so, do not turn back. Until we meet again next week. May God bless and prosper you. Amen. Oh,